Hi folks, welcome back. This is our last lecture on Neanderthals and our penultimate lecture in the entire series. Here we go. What we've been discussing in the previous uh, lectures was whether or not Neanderthals acted as close to the way that we do as we thought they did, or the what aspects of that are changing with the new information we're getting. The nice thing is, as we go forward, we're getting more and more fossils to work from. We're getting more and more tools to work with to understand those fossils, including things like DNA and various dating methods that can tell us exactly how old certain things were, including things like cave paintings and art that we assumed early on was associated with anatomically modern humans. Now we know it is, in fact, should be, in fact, associated with Neanderthals. One of these early, uh, a representation of an early argument that went on for a long time and in fact has had lasting repercussions is the idea of whether or not Neanderthals could speak. The focus of the issue here is what is uh, highlighted in this image, that is the hyoid bone. The hyoid bone is a little bone that hangs out right in the middle of our throat it's easily lost, very tiny, and easily mistaken for a non-human bone. All of these things are, it's also fairly fragile, all these things are what really led to the initial idea here. In fact, there was only one article that was ever written about the absence of the hyoid bone, meaning that they probably could not speak, and that was Lieberman's, except that's just bad science. Let me give it to you this way. To Explain something away because you haven't found it yet, and therefore say it never existed, is folly. Let me give you a fantastic example. How many Toyota cars do I have to see before I say they never made a red Toyota? I would literally have to see every single Toyota ever made to be able to definitively say they never made a red Toyota. How many Toyotas do I have to see to say definitively they did make a red Toyota? One. I only need one to disprove. But I need all of them to prove. Or just because we hadn't found, and I said hadn't in past tense because we have since then found actually quite a few Neanderthal hyoid bones, but just because we hadn't found one yet did not mean they didn't have one. It just meant we didn't find them yet. That's like saying, I can't find my car keys, therefore they never existed. That's crazy. It's just bad science. It's bad logic. The initiator of this idea, his name is Lieberman, has since decided that it's probably not the case. And in fact, it seems to be most people, most scientists, paleoanthropologists anyway, agree that Neanderthals most likely could, in fact, speak. So, truth is, yes, they had a hyoid bone. The other truth is, yes, all of the other aspects of language are there. Yes, they had a different nasolarynx than we do. Their pharyngeal area in their, in their uh, throat was probably different than ours. Does that mean they can't speak? No. In fact, every single mammal on the planet can make noise and control that noise. You don't believe me? Wait for your cat or dog to want their dinner. You'll know that sound. Furthermore, Neanderthals, we now know, their brains were capable of speech. We, in fact, know that their DNA included a derivation of the FOXP2 gene that shows they probably used language. This is all really interesting. Still doesn't have us, we don't have a recording of their language. In fact, even written language didn't exist for another hmm, maybe 100,000 years at best, probably even longer. So here's the thing. How do we understand they could probably speak? Well, again, look at what they're doing. They're, first of all, all of the physiological uh, aspects are there. They can certainly make noise, they can certainly control those noises and control their breathing, and they had all the right things in their brain and in their DNA that allows modern, anatomically modern humans to speak. Therefore, all of the building blocks are there. Were they actually doing it? Well, to discover that, we have to make assumptions. We have to understand, okay, why do people speak? 
Why did language build in the first place? Obviously, it's for communication. But what communication would fall into that? Well, think about what we saw in our last lecture. People like Shannadar I, uh, La Chapelle Saint, these very old Neanderthals who are being buried and cared for. Why were they being cared for? Probably passing on wisdom. Where is that wisdom coming from? How are they imparting that wisdom? More than likely, language. It could be sign language. If you want to go back to kind of ideas that came out in the 1970s and 1980s, like Clan of the Cave Bear crap, you can say, okay, they only spoke in sign language. Well, truth is they probably didn't, but even if they did, that's still a language. But realistically, they more than likely had a spoken language and dialects and everything else just like we do. As I mentioned, their brains are actually larger than ours on average. So chances are they were smart enough to do so, and they probably did so. Let's look at the European Neanderthals now. We, we spent some time talking about the ones who were found down in the Levantine area last time. Now we're going to move up a little bit, moving north just a smidge into what is really Western Europe. We're going to talk a little bit about these folks and what they were doing. The first stuff that I'd like to bring your attention to is cave art. Now, cave art is very interesting. We've got a lot of different ideas about where the cave art came from, what it means, and where it was going. First, let me walk you through some of the cave art that we see associated with anatomically modern humans in nearly the same period as what we're talking about here. It's easier to make these leaps with anatomically modern humans because they're us, therefore we can kind of guesstimate in a much more informed way what they were doing with it. And that will help us understand a little bit more about the Neanderthal. This is Point Dark, which means the bridge of the arch, as you can probably tell why it's named that. But the cave that's in question is at the base of this, and it's a very interesting one. There's some amazing art in there. Let's look at this art, and let me ask you what you see. The first thing likely that you see are these rhino. Right, am I right? We see rhino here, rhino, 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 a whole herd of rhino, or in case you didn't know, a group of rhino is called a crash, which I think is awesome. We also have what seems to be a cave bear or a short-faced bear here, and look at this. You guys see this elk here? We have the antlers here and the the shoulder here, and here's its little haunches, little tail right here. His legs are spindly little legs going down. A couple of things that are very interesting. And also, one last thing I'll mention is this hippo up here, which is interesting. Since when do hippos live in Europe? Well, they did at the time. Rhino, for that matter, too. Okay, what are they doing? What are these drawings? Let me tell you, in anthropology, we associate these drawings with something we call proliferative magic, which let me explain what it is by, first of all, accusing everybody who's listening of this to doing it. Yeah, I just did that. So did I just call you a witch or a warlock or a wizard or anything? I, no, but we all do it. And I'll tell you what proliferative magic is. It is a magic associated with hoping to get more of something that you're representing. What the hell? Let me tell you this, too. I don't care what culture you come from. I guarantee you have some form of proliferative magic in your culture. The most easy one for me to do, because it's the culture I'm from, is Western culture. What do you see at the bottom of every single fountain in the world? You see coins, don't you? We throw coins into every fountain around. Check this out. You guys know the Bellagio fountain in Vegas? The huge one with the, you know, the big fountain display that goes on? It's right on the strip. The Bellagio fountain has so many coins thrown into it every year that they drudge out. And Do you have any idea how much money in coins come out of the Bellagio fountain every year? Over a million dollars. Small change. Over a million dollars comes out every year 
the Bellagio fountain. They claim they have to clean it out so that the movement of the uh, mechanisms under the water that do the huge display aren't damaged. Why are people throwing in change into fountains? In fact, more so, what do you think they're wishing for in Vegas? What is everybody in Vegas for? Have a good time and make money. Gambling. They're wishing by ironically taking money and throwing it into a fountain, they're wishing for more money. The proliferative magic aspect. Hoping, wishing, that's the magic part. Is it real? No, it's magic. There's a lot of rules, aren't there? Don't tell anybody your wish or it won't come true. If proliferative magic doesn't work, whose fault is it? Do we ever blame the magic? Do we ever say, well, that's nonsense? Nope. We always say, oh, you did it wrong. It's the practitioner's fault if it doesn't turn out right. That's the illogical nature of magic, right? Okay. So now looking at this image, what are they hoping for? It's pretty obvious, isn't it? These are prey animals. These are the animals that they're hunting for food in this area. What are they hoping for? They're hoping for a whole bunch of fat, short-legged, can't run very fast, but boy, are they got a lot of meat on them, rhino. In fact, an entire herd of rhino. Where are these being made? They're in the back of a cave. And let me tell you something. If you've never been into a cave with the lights out, you have never seen dark until you've seen cave dark. Cave dark is the absolute absence of light. I don't care if you've been out at night during a, a lunar eclipse, you're still not in the dark as much as caves. Think about all of the ramifications of doing cave art. You've got to go into the back of the cave. How do you know? This is right here. What we're looking at is over 10,000 years old cave art. How do you know that it's in the back of the cave? Pretty obvious. You've got kids, make them close their ears right now. It's because nobody's crawled in there and spray painted fuck in there. Am I right? Vandalism. There is none. This is so deep in the cave. Modern people with flashlights and everything else. Hey, everybody's got a flashlight in their pocket in the form of your, your cell phone. So we're still afraid to go into caves, even with all of our modern conveniences. And yet, these people were going into the back of the cave, ostensibly carrying torches, because there's no other way to do it, to go all the way into the back of this cave, which is inaccessible, even today, by not-so-brave people, to do this. That means it is meaningful. It's important. It's got a point. Why go into the back of the cave? I'll tell you why. To make the magic work. So think of all of what that involves. That involves communication. That involves culture. That involves using fire. That involves having a reason explained to you by ostensibly elders as to what the hell you're going in the back of the cave to do, why you're doing it. Think of all of that. And then put this into perspective with Neanderthals. Okay, so now this particular cave art, well, it may not be as impressive as the newer stuff that we saw with that's associated with anatomically modern people. But then again, keep in mind, this has been there for almost 70,000 years. This is probably 20,000 years before anatomically modern humans got to these caves. This is also found in France. Now, on the left-hand side, you'll see the actual cave art that we have radiocarbon dating, dated, actually they did a uh, different form of dating, but it's the same idea, dated it to a period that was before anatomically modern humans were in the area. On the right-hand side, you see the what you can see if you look at it under different lighting conditions and things like that. The interior images may or may not be... Uh, as old as the thicker line stuff in the dot work. So, what are we looking at? We don't know. But where is it? Same place as the Pont d'Arc cave, 
we're looking at the back of the cave, way deep in there. These are meaningful images put in by Neanderthals. By the way, I know what you're probably thinking. You see this image way over here to the uh, right-hand side, and everybody's like, oh, it's a helicopter on its side, or like a, a parasailer or something like that. Forget it. Get your mind out of the, the what, what the History Channel, and I use that term loosely, has taught you with your ancient aliens and all that garbage. It's absolute pseudoscience. These are not alien images. They are almost always associated with something that is really obvious, and we just don't put it together yet. Or it's a partial image that is mixed and stuff like that. So anyway, it's not aliens. These are Neanderthal that we're doing this. In fact, in some of these caves, we actually found Neanderthal bits and pieces of their bodies left behind, like a dead Neanderthal was in the same camera. Anyway, so what are we talking about here? Think about all of the ramifications that we talked about associated with the other cave art, which was the newer stuff. Now we have no choice but to assume that Neanderthals were doing the same thing under the same, under the same circumstances. So what we have is back of the cave, scary, dark, hard to get to. We know this because this image has been here for tens of thousands of years. That is phenomenal without being damaged, destroyed, or changed. Lastly, we have this idea of why they're going back there and doing this. We don't know. But what we can glean from that is that more, li more than likely, there is some form of communication that is causing them to be interested in doing that. Furthermore, we have these. These are Neanderthal handprints. We find these associated with anatomically modern humans as well. But these are very literally, I was here. This is like spray painting your name on the side of a building, tagging, same idea, signing your signature, signing a guest book. All of this is the same thing. What are we doing? We're leaving our mark. Quite literally what these people are doing. And furthermore, you can see there were some very, very tall individuals, very short individuals. Not surprising. There's a lot of children's hands in here, little kids. Down here, adults, tall adults, up here. Is this hierarchical? Do the colors mean anything? What is happening here? Interesting stuff. Meaningful stuff. Because a lot of these hands, like this one, quite obviously missing a pinky. This individual was, by the way, the red isn't like the blood that spewed out, at least not reality, but maybe artistically it was. I don't know why they use this red ochre for it. But the point that we're making here is likely that this is showing an individual. They're making their mark. Nobody else's. It's they were in that cave. Why does that have meaning? Who made the cave paintings and why? Well, the cave paintings, as I mentioned, date long before anatomically modern humans showed up. We think this is proliferative magic. Could it be a ritual? We don't know. We don't know what other meanings can be said with that. But we can also assume we're talking about a record of individuals. With these handprints, this is an image that nobody else has. This is your hand was in that spot. That's meaningful. That's meaningful to us. Therefore, we can extrude. It was probably meaningful for them. So what happened? We have a lot of assumptions, don't we? We have a lot of preconceived notions of why we're here and the Neanderthals aren't. Were they lousy hunters? <laughs> Not at all. They were much more successful hunters than we ever were. In fact, they were built for it. Their entire culture was based around it. And their bodies needed that protein. They had an extremely advanced tool tradition that allowed them to make 
these these stone tools that were really high end high tech if you will they were hunting massive animals stuff that our species wouldn't even think about until much later until we designed weapons that can kill at a distance but these guys were doing it way earlier than that when we're talking stabbing spears instead of throwing spears like javelins we're talking about cutting and stabbing these massive animals hand to hand up close and personal like we mentioned in the last episode but now the animals are being processed for food and clothing and useful items we know that they had a very high protein diet we know that neanderthals were burying their dead Therefore, they had some form of individuality. In other words, they thought, hey, I'm going to bury that guy and not that guy for whatever reason. And where they buried them. Probably because they're close to that person. They care about that person. They're keeping people alive for long periods of time because they cared about those people. This is culture, whether you like it or not. So what happened to them? Why are we here and they're not? Well, fundamentally, you have to understand the Pleistocene and the end of the Pleistocene and what came with it. The Pleistocene was very cold. In fact, up to a third of the Earth was covered with ice at the time. That is an amazing amount. So the Neanderthal were cold weather adapted people. But the Ice Age was starting to recede. It was getting warmer, wetter. And what do we see? We see this sort of reemergence of swampy kind of uh, wetlands and deciduous trees and all of the things that go along with it, with the flora and fauna. We see the downfall of huge animals like woolly mammoth. They started to not thrive as much in that environment. The thriving animals were the smaller ones that were able to get around quicker, eat a little less, or a lot less, and survive in this much warmer environment. So what happened to the Neanderthals? Well, we can explain that with what we just talked about. The Neanderthals kind of went out with the woolly mammoth. Or did they? We know what happened to them in the, in the aspect of, as the climate got warmer, their bodies were too warm. They weren't well adapted to this new, warmer, wetter climate. So what happened to them? What happened to their bodies? Where did they go? Well, we already know the answer to that. We know that we were interbreeding with them. We know that our offspring with them most likely Evolution would favor those that were more the thinner, lighter build, like us. Because that was the body type that was more well adapted to that environment. This should sound very familiar to you. If you guys remember our early talks about evolution, now it works. It's all about adaptation to your given environment. So as that is happening, if the Neanderthal and anatomically modern human family, mixed family, have a kid, and that kid is a big, burly Neanderthal build, and then they have another kid, and it's the light, lean, thin, tall, warm, climate-adapted, Allen's rule-adapted body that's more adapted for this environment, who's going to live longer? Well... The long, tall, skinny guy doesn't require as much meat or food. So the thicker kid has to go out and eat, what, 17 possums and 186 mice a day. <laughs> I'm just making up these numbers, but they're not eating as much meat as they would have gotten out of a single woolly mammoth kill, right? So there's not as much around anymore. There's more vegetables and greenery and lighter stuff. So the kid that doesn't require as much protein, as much calorie, that kid is going to live longer. And they start to see this. Now, when you're choosing a mate, and you're a human woman, and you're like, hmm, that Neanderthal guy is pretty big, big and thick and burly, but he's big and thick and burly, and he's dying at 30. 
because he can't get enough food, or do I want to have a baby with that tall, skinny guy who's living till he's 50 because he can find enough food? Well, I'm going to have the big, tall, skinny guy. So as you see, as time goes by, mate selection plays a big part in this too. That's what happened to the Neanderthals. They became us over a long period of time with interbreeding.